so just to start off, a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Michael Generakis. Uh, if you can't tell from my accent, I'm from Australia. Um, I started a company recently, uh, Asset Note. I'm not going to talk about it because it's not this kind of, not that kind of con. But uh, if you want to chat to me about it afterwards, that's cool. Um, before that, I was the director of Spider Labs in Asia Pac. Um, spoken at a bunch of conferences before, mostly on mobile stuff um, around the way. Um, I also organise uh, a much more disorganised conference than this in Australia called Tuscon, um, and also a local meetup in in Brisbane. And uh, for anybody who's part of DuckSec, I am a flat duck enthusiast. Um, I'll have a few beers and I'll tell you about that. Cool. So just a bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about today and, and really where this talk is coming from. Um, so it's just a bit of a crash course uh, into messing with the runtime of iOS applications, um, mostly for like pen testing and bug bounty purposes, right? I did a similar um, presentation at a local conference in Brisbane uh, a few years ago, uh, but a lot has really changed since then. So you know, the big one, obviously, is Swift was introduced. Um, and you know that's changed a lot of things. Uh, Apple has pushed 64-bit only as well. Um, so I forget which uh, exact iOS version they stopped supporting 32-bit uh, uh, apps, but uh, you know they, they don't anymore. Um, there's also been a rise in sort of cross-platform frameworks. Um, so so frameworks that allow you to develop uh, in a particular language and then uh, access native functionality across multiple platforms without having to write separate native apps. Um, and the tooling has evolved, and we'll discuss in the presentation. It's also, in some areas, not really kept up. Um, so it's really just an updated presentation. If you've seen that one before online or whatever, it is an updated presentation to cover, co cover this. It's focused on iOS app testing, so like no mad iOS kernel OJ, sorry. Um, I wouldn't be presenting it to you, probably, uh, if I had that. Um, cool. So setting up your environment. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about this, but there are plenty of guides on the internet. Um, and because we've got limited time, uh, I honestly haven't timed this talk. I was working all night on it. Um, so we'll see how we go. Um, but the main tools that you will need, um, and we'll cover it in the presentation, um, it's obviously a jailbroken device. Um, currently up to iOS 11.0. Three, I believe, can be jailbroken. Um, you know, some things you can do on a jail device. It's not as easy and it's not as straightforward, um, and you can't do as many things. But, um, but yeah, for for the purpose of this presentation, we'll be using a jailbroken device. Um, in terms of some of the tools that we'll be using, uh, Frida, Script, uh, Mobile Substrate, uh, Class Dump, SSH, Disassembler. Uh, of some kind, um, you know, essentially all you need. Um, there's a bunch of recent tools uh, that are really good, so like Objection by, by SensePost and Needle by MWR. Um, they're really nice and they abstract away uh, a lot of what I'm talking about here um, and, and make it you know, easier to use. Um, but you know, I want to discuss a little bit more of the techniques and at, at a lower level so you guys can get a feel for you know, how you could do it yourself, but also how those sort of tools work if you, if you do use those. Cool. So we'll start with uh, Objective-C apps. So most iOS apps are still written in Objective-C, um, or ha at least have some Objective-C component. Um, the trend is definitely moving away from Objective-C, um, you know, f particularly for consumer apps. Um, but Objective-C frameworks will still be around for a while. Um, Apple's got a bunch of internal frameworks um, that they, you know, supply as part of iOS that aren't likely to be updated to Swift anytime soon. Um, so, so it's still something that you should know um, when you are doing iOS hacking, right? And it's not that bad. A lot of people don't like Objective C, but you know, it's not it's not too bad once you get used to it. Um, so that's a bit blurry. So sorry about that. We're using VGA, but um, here's just like a little bit of a primer on the Objective C thing in syntax. So on the left here. You've got, uh, you've got your header file with the, sort of the interface. Um, you can see there there's the at interface keyword. Um, you've got the, the class name. And after the colon, you've got the superclass, so, so what it inherits from. Um, you've got your properties. Um, so it's just you know, property, some characteristics. You don't really need to bother with those. Um, the type, and then the property name. And then you've got your, your class methods and your instance methods. So the class methods are denoted by the plus, and the, uh, the instance methods are, notice, are denoted by the dash. Um, and you've got, in the brackets, you've got the return type, 
and then you've got the you've got the function name. Uh, you can see here uh, for the for the instance method with parameter, uh, there's the that's the syntax if you've got parameters. Um, an interesting thing to note, and it will come into play a little bit later on, is it's pretty common as a design pattern in uh, Objective C apps and or iOS apps in general to have the sort of the first uh, does the function name uh, indicate what the first parameter is? So this is just a really contrived example, but it might be, I don't know, um, log in with user, and then the parameter will be like a user, uh, you know, something related to the user or whatever. Um, that's pretty common. Um, and then you've got, on the right-hand side, you've just got the implementation. So it looks pretty much the same. Um, you, with the properties, you synthesize the properties. So that, all that does is, uh, at compile time, it just generates the getter and setter methods. Um, for that property, um, so you don't have to write it out yourself. Um, then uh, you've got uh, you know, your, your class methods and your instance methods. Pretty straightforward. It doesn't look too, too different, right? That's, that's sort of the basic syntax of, of Objective-C. Um, you really don't need to know all that much Objective-C to, to be dangerous um, for most pen testing tasks, right? So just like basic object-oriented principles, like the difference between a class and object, difference between a, like a class method and an instance method, uh, a very like rudimentary understanding of, of the MVC design pattern. Uh, iOS apps um, adopt this pattern. Uh, not all of them. There are you know some hipsters who like to do like you know reactive kind of stuff. Um, but you know for the most part. You know, Apple pushes as a standard, you know, an MVC design pattern. And when I say rudimentary, I really mean rudimentary. Like, if you just think of, you know, the M being the model, right, which is data, um, and you know, V um, being the view, which is like the presentation UI, and C being the controller, which is kind of the logic. Like, that's if you're gonna get that, then you know, you can kind of understand what's going on from from you know what we're gonna discuss. Um, you know, how to call methods, the syntax to call methods, we'll go over that, and how to sort of read and write variables. Um, and then just that basic syntax, um, you know, class syntax that we saw in the previous slide. So you don't really need to know that much. You don't need to be an expert programmer to, to be able to be dangerous um, for, for this sort of stuff. So let's get into reverse engineering Objective-C apps. So Objective-C executables need to have a bunch of uh, class information in order to run and to support the dynamic features of the language. Uh, and it's great for us as you know, pen testers because we can extract this information and it gives us insight into how the application is architected and, and how it runs and how it functions. Um, you know, for a pen tester or a bug hunter, this gives you a map of the application to help you, you know, with finding potential vulnerabilities and you know, attacking the runtime. So back in the day, Class Dump Z was the go-to for this, uh, as it had better iOS support than some of the alternatives. Um, but it's not actively developed. You can see there, like copyright 2009. Um, so it doesn't really work on 64-bit apps or or any kind of Swift or mixed mixed apps. Um, so that's a bummer. Hasn't really kept up. Um, but for Objective C apps, um, the original Class Dump utility by Steve Nygaard. It's still probably the best. Uh, it's also not really actively developed, um, but it still works for, for sort of pure Objective-C apps. It works fine. Um, you can, of course, use something like Otool, um, which is a, 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 you know, comes with the Mac. Um, it gives you a lot of uh, different ways to sort of uh, mess with the, the binary, uh, get extract information out of the binary, but it's not presented in a really like easy to digest way, uh, in, in the same way that class dump is. Um, you could also get this information out of a disassembler, but you know for the first pass when you're looking at this, um, definitely you know a class dump uh, from from the class dump utility is is really the way to go. That's the uh, command that I use. Um, I'll go through in the demo, uh, you know what those what those sort of uh, options do. They're just like formatting, right? And usually I just pipe it out to a, a or output it to a, a file. Uh, you can see I've got the .h extension on that. The reason I do that is because when you load it up into a, uh, a text editor, which you'll see, uh, it just automatically does the syntax highlighting. So that's the only reason I do that. Um, and you're not going to be able to see this, but that's fine. I do have it in, <laughs> I do have something in the demo. That's a class dump of Instagram I was doing for like a bounty thing not too long ago. Um, yeah, I'll probably just skip that and go in, in the detail of that and go to, you know, wait for the demo. Um, 
and uh, I'll go through the class dump and you know some of the stuff that you'd look for when you're analyzing uh, analyzing the stuff. Um, so before you can actually do any of these tasks, um, you need to decrypt the binary. So iOS apps uh, that are downloaded from the App Store are protected by Apple's DRM, uh, and the binary is encrypted. So to be able to analyze the binary, um, whether it's for getting a class dump or a disassembly or whatever, you need to decrypt it first, right? Um, the, the way that you do it, or the, the kind of methodology, um, it's pretty simple. You sort of work out the correct offsets for the encrypted portion of the binary. You uh, extract that en uh, encrypted portion uh, after it's loaded at runtime, because um, obviously it needs to be decrypted to, to run. Um, and then you take that now decrypted um, portion and you shove it back in uh, to the binary. You patch it back in, and you're, you're good to go. Um, you can do this manually, and there's plenty of sort of guides on the internet to how to you know how to do this, um, but there's heaps of tools out there to, to automate it, um, so I wouldn't bother doing it manually. Um, I prefer to use Clutch uh, for decrypting binaries. I guess this is probably the point where I should say be responsible and say don't use this for like pirating apps. Um, there's a big warning uh, when you when you go to their GitHub page. You know, not cool, but um, it's really useful for for security analysis, right? Um, so those are the options, um, but really what you want to do is the uh, dash D um, option, which dumps the, the bundle ID into an IPA file. Uh, you could also do uh, dash B, which just dumps the binary portion, so you could do, just do the binary for you know, your, your class dump and you know, disassembly and stuff like that, but I like to get the, the whole IPA file because it also has a bunch of other interesting files. So if it's a cross-platform app, often they'll have all of those, say, the JavaScript files or you know, even some of the compiled DLLs for, for Xamarin um, apps and things like that. Uh, it also has like, some interesting sort of settings and whatever. So uh, it's useful in a broader context, but specifically for what we're going to talk about today, it's not necessary, but that's you know, what I do normally on a pen test. Um, so once you've got the class dump, uh, the next step is really just to go through and start analyzing the class dump and seeing what you can get out of it. Um, so essentially, once you have that application, uh, the, the class dump, it becomes like a map of the application. You can sort of see where everything fits together. Um, so the first thing you want to do is sort of look for in interesting functionality. So authentication, in particular local auth uh, authentication and other sort of local checks, are definitely something that, that's interesting from a security perspective. How the app is doing data storage, um, in particular key management, right? Um, that's usually pretty poor on, uh, on mobile apps, um, you know, storing the, the keys with the lock is, you know, not really great. Um, people don't do a good job. Um, security checks and controls, things like jailbreak detection or prevention, anti-debugging and other sort of more advanced runtime security measures, um, uh, you know, you, you want to often deal with these simply because if you're doing it in the broader context of, say, a pen test, uh, often these can stop you from, from completing that and doing other tasks that you might want to do. And so, so you'll need to look for that and potentially, you know, break that, which we'll go into in, in the presentation. Uh, you know, how it handles transport security, so it doesn't implement cert pinning. Um, you know, how, how does it interact with the backend APIs? Uh, is it, you know, if it's using, you know, if there's no sort of cert pinning issues uh, and it's using HTTP, HTTPS, it's not too bad. Um, but often you'll find in mobile apps they use, uh, you know, different kind of protocols or custom protocols uh, or unusual protocols that aren't easily, um, uh, aren't easily sort of intercepted. So, you know, you might want to uh, have a look at, you know, if it's got some kind of custom network stack and it's implementing it. You might want to hook those functions and sort of see what's going on there. Uh, and you can also sort of see what frameworks and third party libraries are in use. So, if there's anything that has known vulnerabilities, you can kind of get an idea for that as well. Um, so, once you've identified the interesting functionality and you have uh, a broad understanding of how the application is architected, you can start to look for potential security issues. So uh, some of the, the key things and really the, the three sort of broad categories that you would look for from a runtime security perspective um, is simple application logic that can be uh, exploited, so bypassing security checks, access control and auth bypass, and we'll go through a few of those in the demo. Uh, sensitive information that you can extract from memory, so things like auth keys, password, encryption keys, whatever. Um, and then exploiting the way data at rest and transit is secured, right? So bypassing cert pinning and validation, you know, how they're doing encryption of any client-side data storage, right? Cool. So we'll go into a demo which I've pre-recorded because I'm a good boy. Um, so this is just a really simple app. 
um, Subjective-C app. Um, so it's got a couple of jailbreak checks. Oh, that's terrible. Um, but uh, that's cool. So it's just checking they're both failing and saying that you've you know you're jailbroken. And this is a little password, like a login field. It's just saying the password that I typed in is incorrect, right? So you know, pretty pretty basic. Um, I'll make these available as well online if you you know want to see them, because uh, yeah, the projector is not so great. Um, but yeah, so let's run through this demo. Um, so geez, that is terrible. Uh, I can't even see it on my screen. Um, that's great. Um, so that basically what I'm doing here is I'm just running class dump Z showing that it doesn't work, right? I had the screenshot in there. Um, now I'm getting class dump. Um, and so this is just some of the options which you can't make out, obviously. Uh, it's mostly formatting options. I like to sort it by inheritance uh, and also the methods alphabetically. Um, and so, yeah, and then I'm just actually running the command on, that, on the binary of that application that I showed you. And I'm just, as, as I did in the presentation, uh, I'm outputting it to a file on the desktop. And then I'm opening that in a text editor, which is written in Electron, because you know, I'm a hipster or whatever. Um, and uh, this is not going to work. But yeah, so we've got our class dump, right? Um, you have to trust me on this, right? <laughs> um, so I just did the syntax highlighting, so that shows how close the, the formatting is um, to like an, a standard Objective-C header file. Because um, I've sorted by inheritance, you got all the protocols first, and you got your app delegate, um, and a couple of classes that we've got in there. Um, and so, you know, pretty, pretty small app, pretty, pretty simple. Um, so what I would typically do um, is just start searching, right? So it's just, you know, grep or you know command F, right? Where I usually start is the app delegate. Um, that's kind of essentially main for iOS apps, right? It's really the the, the point where the developer gets control. Um, and usually this is just a small app, so it's got really nothing in it. But usually uh, there's a bunch of interesting stuff that the developers kind of just chucked in the app delegate because it, it you know that's where it goes. Um, you can see here, so you've got the class name, uh, you've got the superclass, and in the angled brackets, I didn't go through that in the syntax, but that's just the protocols that it conforms to. Um, then you've got the different you know, class and instance methods. Then I start looking for interesting stuff, like I start searching jailbreak, I start searching password and things like that. You can see there's some interesting looking classes here. You've got this jailbreak manager class, which you know, seems like it would probably be handling those jailbreak checks, right? Um, you've got this one, you can't read it, but it says totally interesting information here. Um, so it's a bit obvious, right? And then you've got a couple of variables, which are password, username, and then there's uh, a couple of um, couple of methods. So you've got a, uh, a class method that's called get encryption key, and then two instance methods that uh, get password and get username. Then we're looking at the view controller. So when you think about it from our rudimentary understanding of MVC, right, you've got, uh, this is where the logic is. So you can see some, you know, like the login button pressed and, you know, jailbreak check one and two. Um, there, there is an interesting one uh, there called user is authenticated. You'll have to take my word for it, um, but yeah, it's definitely definitely there. Cool. So let's move on to like actually manipulating the runtime of the app, right? Um, so you know, once you have an idea of what you want to target, the next step is to actually then manipulate the runtime and exploit the issue to achieve your objective. So commonly, the it falls into like a few sort of simple buckets, right? Um, reading variables, uh, the values of variables out of memory or modifying them, um, calling methods directly, you know, typically to sort of exploit poor logic in the application flow, and then rewriting the implementation uh, of a particular function to change the way the app functions. And we'll go through all of those in various ways. Um, there are a number of tools and techniques you can use to complete these tasks. So frameworks and tools such as Script and, and Frida, um, using a, a debugger like LLDB, um, writing your own dynamic libraries and linking them in, um, or, or even just patching the binary can, can often achieve some of the same uh, objectives. Um, I'm glad the photo of Christian came out. That's great. Um, so Script. So Script is kind of an old tool um, written by uh, the same guy who does Cydia, who writes Cydia. Um, it's a ridiculous name because it's pronounced script. It's not written like that, at least in my mind. Um, but it has an even more ridiculous premise, which is a programming language designed to blend the barrier between Objective-C and JavaScript 
I don't know about you guys, but like that just seems ridiculous to me. Um, but it is a really great tool for interrogating and manipulating the runtime of the app. So um, yeah, Christian is a hipster. Um, so using script. So um, you can use it to load script scripts, which is why I hate that name. Um, or you can use it interactively, which is usually when, how, you, how you use it. So most of the time you want to hook into the running app to use it interactively, um, and it's just the dash P, and then you provide it the application name or the process ID. Um, and then you know, there are a lot, a lot of people moving to Frida these days for a lot of the same tasks, but you, know, you can use script. Um, uh, but I like I use script, um, and it's still a very handy tool. It's kind of like got a different focus to Frida, and there was a bit of a spat between like the developers of both of those uh, around you know what what the sort of purpose of each one is. Um, script was really more designed for like tweak developers to sort of you know play around, see how things are working. Whereas Frida is definitely more of a security research tool. But you know we'll go into both. Um, here's some little tips and tricks that you know you might want to commonly do. Um, so you know you might want to get the bundle. ID, so just MS bundle, main bundle, bundle identifier. Um, dumping instance variables, just the little asterisks in front of the object you want to dump the variables out of. Um, getting all the objects of a class is also something that's, that's useful, uh, and I'll explain why in my demos that you probably can't see. Um, but it's got this really cool function called choose, um, which basically takes a parameter of a class name, and then it goes through and tries to find all the uh, instances of, of that. Um, for Swift apps, uh, the, the sort of syntax kind of breaks with, with Swift. Um, so instead of just putting in you know, module.class name, you have to use this other method um, called Objective-C get class, right? Because um, it just breaks the JavaScript stuff and you get like, uh, you know, things are undefined and whatever. Um, and then to replace the implementation of an existing method, um, it's just the name of the class, dot prototype, dot, you know, the function that you want to replace, and then it, you, you're just basically replacing it with a JavaScript function that does whatever you want. Um, usually if it's like simple logic, you know, the, the, um, the new implementation is usually not that complex, right? Um, but yeah, we'll go into that. Um, so you, you can load up scripts. So this little script here just prints the methods or attempts to print the methods of a particular class. Um, so you could type that into the script sort of REPL, I suppose. Um, or you can just create a .cy script and like load it in when you load, um, load you know, inject um, script into the, the process. And so you don't have to keep typing it out, right? Um, so yeah, if you do use that, um, print methods, you the class that gets all the instance methods, and then if you add the second parameter for true, um, it also gets the class methods. All right, let's get into the demo that you probably won't be able to see. All right, so all I'm doing here, on the right-hand side, um, I'm just uh, setting up a tunnel over USB to my device so I can connect to it, um, which is now what I'm doing here with SSH. All right, so I'm logging in. All right, so now I'm connected to my iOS device, which is running the app on the other side there. And so I'm just now loading up script um, and injecting into that Objective-C app that's running on the side. Um, and you can see that I'm just getting the, the bundle identifier, so you can see that it is that app. Um, and there's a, a few cool sort of features. So here I'm just uh, calling a method and the exact same sort of Objective-C syntax that you would do. So it, do, it definitely does bridge Objective-C and JavaScript. Um, so you can see I'm just getting the, the application instance there. Um, and you know, you, then you can you know, get the, the delegate, which gives you the, the app delegate instance. And, but then script also has a bunch of shortcuts. So for the application instance, you can use UI app, and then, then you can do things like UI app dot delegate, and you get those same instances. Um, trust me, those things are the same. Uh, there's also um, history and like tab completion as well, uh, which is what I was just demonstrating there, um, which is yeah, kind of kind of handy and kind of nice. Um, so uh, move on. Wait, no. Screw it on my demo. All right. 
So this is just demonstrating getting the um, instance methods using the asterisk little shortcut. Um, that's for the, the app delegate. So now we're going back to the class dump, and you'll start to see why this is a useful uh, document. Um, so here we're going in this totally interesting information here class, and we're using it as a map to sort of help us, um, you know, navigate through the through the runtime. And so here I'm highlighting this get encryption key method, which you know seems like something we might want to see what it returns. Um, and because it's a class method, you can just call it using the class name. So I've got the open square uh, square brackets. You know, put in the totally interesting information here class, and then type it, and this comes back with a string saying this is an encryption key, right? And this is common. You'll see this all the time in iOS apps, right? Um, but I'm trying now to uh, to call the get instance. Uh, get password instance method, and it throws an error because I'm calling on the class, right? So going back to these OO principles, right? You don't, you can't call it on the class. You have to call it on the instance, uh, like the actual object, right? Um, so one of the ways that I sort of find out, you know, where these instances are or references to it, is I search for the class name. Now this is a very small app, so there's, there's this instance here. So in the view controller, um, there's an instance of that particular class. Um, so now what I want to do, and you can see why we call this a bit of a map, right? Now what I want to do is go to that view controller instance and then get that variable, read that variable um, to get an instance. Um, so uh, for iOS, um, the app has a key window property which always has a root view controller. So in this particular case, um, it's just the view controller because it's a very simple app. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm typing there is uiapp.keywindow.rootviewcontroller. It's just returning the instance of that view controller class. Um, so one of the things you can do here, um, so going back now, um, I want to read this instance out to get the instance of that totally, you know, interesting information here class. Should have made that a shorter name. Um, and there, it's returning an instance of, of that class. So it's, it's read that variable. And so now um, we can use that. Now we could type out, you know, all of that string, right? You know, this dot this dot this. Or you can create a reference, like so. This is just a JavaScript variable, um, and I'm calling it info, and I'm just using the instance function in script, and then giving it the the pointer um, to that instance, and then now I've got a reference to that that I can use without having to type it all out, right? Um, so I can just, if you just see, I typed in info, um, and it came back with that um, that instance. So now that we've got that, we go back to the class dump and we say, okay, well, let's try and call these instance methods now. Um, so we can just reference it using the, the info variable that we created. And then we're typing get username, which comes back with username, and get password, which come back with password. Um, and then we can also read the variables as well um, with just, you know, the, the reference that we created, info dot password, which is what we're doing. All right, so yeah, password, there you go. Um, I made that different to the actual password for the login, just so you, you know we do some different things, right? So now what we're going to do is have a look at this jailbreak check. So the first jailbreak check, we hit it, and it says jailbreak check failed because obviously we are on a jailbroken device, right? Um, so again, let's go back. I mean, normally we just search around for jailbreak, but it's right there because it's a tiny app. And you can see here we've got an instance method that says jail check jailbreak that returns a Boolean value. So likely what's doing the check, it's returning you know, true or false depending on whether it's, uh, whether it's um, uh, jailbroken or not. Um, but you can see here, um, you know, trying to do what we did with the last one where we go through and we're like, okay, um, Here's the different uh, you know, instances of that. We're not finding it, right? Um, but what we see here is this class method called shared jailbreak manager. And that's a common pattern uh, in uh, iOS apps. It's called singleton pattern. Basically, that returns uh, the, an instance of that class, typically. So, um, so basically, uh, you know, when you're going through a much larger, more complex app, you, know, you do a search for shared, and you can see you know, all of that kind of stuff. So here, I'm just calling that, that uh, class method. And it's returning the, an instance of Jailbreak Manager, which I can then um, use. I'm creating a reference called JBM um, to, to that particular instance.
And then I'm now going to call that uh, instance method called check jailbroken um, using that reference that we created. And that's going to return um, true, right? Um, because it is jailbroken, right? So what we want to do uh, now is change that to return false and see if that defeats the check, right? So this is where you know you could you look for things like simple logic that can be you know like flags that can be switched over and whatever. So here we're using using the syntax that I spoke about before, where you've got the class name dot prototype dot the method name. Um, and then just equals, and then we're just uh, um, you know changing it with an anonymous function that simply returns false. Um, so that'll return false all the time, and now you can see jailbreak check passed, right? So we've now defeated that logic, and now we're now we're good. Moving on. Um, so yeah, this is just demonstrating the choose functionality, right, and why it's useful. So you saw how we could kind of navigate through throughout the app to get those instances, or choose just returns all the uh, all the instances um, of a particular class in uh, you know as an array that you can then just use, which is kind of cool. All right. So we have more on this. So now we're going to look at the um, authentication, right? And see if we can bypass that, because it's just local auth, right? Um, so here, you know, just to show what it does again, you know, you're typing in a password, which is incorrect. Uh, you hit login, it says password incorrect, right? So we want to we wanna see what we can do. So again, going back to the class dump. So uh, again, simple understanding of MVC, right? Where would the logic for this be, right? Be in the controller. So, um, so we've got the view control here. Um, you can see here you've got some uh, buttons uh, and you know some some different actions. So likely to be where this is. Um, so you can see like login button pressed. So that's obviously doing something when you press the login button. Uh, but then there's also this other interesting one here called user is authenticated. So what we're going to see is like what happens if we call user is authenticated directly. So again, we need to get the instance of the view controller because it's an instance method, um, which we're just using the same technique that we used before. You know, UI app dot key window dot root view controller. See, there's the instance there. And then we're just uh, using that and, and calling it. I'm just going to minimize that just so, um, yeah, I was just checking what it's called. Although you've got tab completion and script, so it doesn't really matter. Let's minimize that so you can see that it works. And there you go, password correct. Now, this is actually quite common in uh, iOS apps where you'll find this kind of process where developers will kind of abstract everything away. So what they'll do is they'll do like uh, the button was pressed and then they'll call like a, maybe a check function to check, you know, say check the creds or whatever. Then after that, it will, it will call like, you know, now go and display this view controller, right? So what you can do with that is, particularly if it's local auth, is if you can, you know, basically short circuit it and jump around the check, either you could change the check to return whatever you want it to be, um, often it won't work because it'll, it'll require a password input that you don't know, um, but you could brute force it maybe, writing a little script, or you, know, you just sort of short circuit it and go to, hey, you know, present this view controller. And if it's local auth um, and it's sort of been authenticated before and there's data populated in it, it'll work. Um, for apps that use um, so like a backend API um, to populate it and it uses sort of say typical session authentication, that kind of technique doesn't really work. So even if it, even if it is possible to do that in the app, um, you know, you'll, you'll jump to that you know, view controller, but there'll be no, no data, right? Because it's not, not able to you know, actually get it down from the, the API. Um, but you know, there's a lot of apps that, do, that are interesting that do use local auth. The one that I didn't do here, but I usually demo it, is Evernote, like the pin code controller. You, know, you can easily bypass that and other things like that. So um, cool. So next, 
oh yeah, the, all I'm showing here is that that change that we made to the jailbreak check, um, that's at runtime. So when we close that app and we fire it up again, um, it's not persistent, right? So it's saying that it's failed again, all right? So there are ways to make it persistent, and I'll go through some of them, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's all I was showing there. So let's move on to Frida. So Frida is kind of the new hotness when it comes to messing with mobile apps. Um, it's from their website, a dynamic instrumentation toolkit for developers, reverse engineers, and security researchers. Uh, it essentially just injects Google's V8 engine into a process so you can execute Java in that, the context of that process, access memory, and all that kind of stuff. Um, Frida can be used in many ways, um, and it's really a great sort of framework toolkit, and I recommend looking into it. Um, it has many different bindings for all different kinds of languages that you're familiar with. So if you don't like JavaScript, there's Python and whatever. Um, it's mainly used to write scripts and tools, um, but it, can also, it also comes bundled with a bunch of tools that you can use to get an idea of what it's capable of, help you with your scripts and stuff like that. Um, those new tools that I mentioned uh, earlier at the start of the presentation utilize Frida and rely on it and often quite heavily. So it's good to understand how, how Frida works. Um, so Frida comes bundled with some tools that you can use right off the bat. So forgetting about writing scripts, uh, you've got Frida CLI, Frida PS, Frida Trace, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Frida CLI and Frida Trace are probably the ones you, that are most immediately useful for pen testing. Um, we'll go into, go into that uh, in a second. So now we're looking at the second jailbreak check, right? Um, so you won't be able to read it, but it says jailbreak check fails, look harder for the check. Right? So the text is, is, is kind of different. Um, and I'll explain why that is in a second. So, OK, following the process that we've, we've become used to, we go back to the class dump. We start looking for jailbreak, right? We come up with the jailbreak manager, but that was for the, the last one, right? It's obviously not controlling this other one. Um, so, you know, and then it's just going through like the buttons and the other references to the jailbreak check buttons uh, and all that. Um, And you know, so, so you might start looking for like root or like check or whatever, and it and it you know it's not really working because um, it's not there, right? So what can you do? Um, this is common. Like developers will kind of try and hide, uh, you know, these sorts of checks. Um, like ones I've come across, like you know, for a banking app, it's like you know get store location or whatever, right? And they try to hide it. I had one where like they just made all the security stuff like random strings, which just made it stand out in the class dump. I'm like, well, I'm going to look at those, right? And it, it must have been like, really difficult to, um, to code. So but a little trick I do in those sort of instances is I look at the text, right? So usually there'll be a pop-up. You can see that the text is different. Well, you can't see it, but I, I'll, you know, I'll vouch for it. Uh, it's different. It says, look harder for the check, right? Um, so a, a cool technique to use is you fire up a disassembler. Um, and you look for that. Uh, you look for that string, right, and see where it's being being used. So just firing up Ida here, um, and basically going and doing a search for that string. And I've used this multiple times uh, on on tests to sort of see where these hidden jailbreak checks are, uh, checks are um, or other kind of sensitive stuff. And so you can see here. Well, no, you can't. Uh, it's in the view controller. This jailbreak check two. Um, button is kind of being referenced here. And you can see there's sort of two branches. On that right, right hand side where my mouse is, that's the positive branch where it says, um, you know, you're not jailbroken. And this is the one that has the text that says, you know, look harder for the check. So this is obviously what's happening. So if you scroll up to before that kind of branch, um, you can't see the text here. But what I was trying to point out here is like, you don't even need to really understand any of this assembly to kind of understand what's going on. That's saying shared application, the next string down is delegate, the next string down is a function name. So basically what that's saying is that um, there's this function that's being called, that's named that, which you can't read, um, and it's in, the, um, it's in the app delegate. So let's go back to our class dump and go back to the app delegate and have a look at that. So have a look at the app delegate, there's that method. And it kind of looks very similar to the other methods, but if you've done a lot of iOS testing, you'll see all those other methods are boilerplate methods for like state transition stuff that automatically get generated for you. Um, and this one was kind of designed to be a bit sneaky and, and kind of blend in with that. Um, it's called application terminates after background, and it, and it returns a Boolean value. So um, I've basically written a script in Frida to modify that, right? Um, so the first variable there is just the class name, then the uh, function that we're hooking, so that was what we found. 
Um, then the next is just building a hook string. Um, and then this is really what it's doing. So this is the uh, interceptor. Um, uh, it's basically uh, attaching um, uh, and using the hook and then uh, and basically saying change the implementation. And then uh, it's calling this JavaScript function here. Um, which is all it's doing, like the rest is just sort of you know, console output, but all that's doing is taking the, um, the return value and changing it to zero from one. So changing it from, from true to false. And so it will always return zero, which will be false. So if we go back to Frida, um, so that all I'm doing here is Frida U, which is connecting to my, uh, my USB device. Then, um, I'm referencing the script, um, injecting into that. Um, so I was just checking that it was still failing at that point, um, just so you could see that. And uh, now I, you know, it's now Frida's running, and I hit the, that button. You can see now it says jailbreak check passed, right? Um, so, so that's now, and every time you press it, it's running that function, and you know, it's, it's changing the return value. So you now bypass that check. And that's, a, that's often a more persistent way to do it uh, on a pen test if you want to make things a little bit more persistent. All right, let's uh, race through Swift apps because I don't have a lot of time. Um, but yeah, so as I said, increasingly um, developers are using Swift apps to write uh, iOS code. Um, and it's impacting some of the techniques and tools that you, know, you would usually use for Objective-C applications that we discussed. Um, in general, mobile app security sense, like testing Swift apps isn't actually all that different, except for some of the stuff that we'll be talking about. Um, most issues in iOS apps, uh, like any other app, right, due to poor design decisions, misconfigurations, or like incorrect implementation of like system frameworks, third-party frameworks, stuff like that. But yeah, what's really changed is how you sort of reverse engineer the application. Um, so Swift, everybody kind of knows about Swift. Like oh, I'm, I'm rushing through some of these less relevant bits. Um, it's created by Apple. Eventually, it's going to, you know, the idea is that it replaces Objective-C. Um, here's the basic syntax. It's a lot cleaner than Objective-C. You've got um, mutable values and immutable values, let and var. And then you, it, it Swift in first type, but you can be explicit with your type as well, um, which is with the colon and the type. Um, this is a class declaration, um, so you know, class, and then you've got your properties. You can have a property with a default value. Um, yeah, cool, 10 minutes. Uh, property with a default value, then you've got your initializer, which basically um, you know, initializes any of the properties that don't have a default, because obviously you know, when it gets initialized, it just uses the default value. Um, the class functions, uh, class methods, uh, are uh, denoted by the class uh, keyword, and then functions are denoted by the, the func keyword. Um, and so you got class methods, instance methods, parameters. Uh, the only thing that's really kind of interesting here is um, here with this one where it's like uh, instance method with an exported parameter name. So you look here, you've just got the parameter name and the type. Here you've got an exported parameter name and then the parameter name and the type. And that'll, that'll, I'll explain why that's relevant. And then you've got the little dash and the return type, um, which is Boolean, and then you've got, you know, you just do your implementations. Cool. Um, and then so yeah, to initialize a class, it's just class, and then you you um, pass it the the, ver um, the various sort of property values that you need to initialize it, um, and then calling class method right like Objective C is just calling on the actual class, and then instance methods you get called on the um, on the actual object, and then with an exported parameter name you need to put in that exported name, um, whereas in the previous, in the middle example, you don't actually need to put in the uh, the parameter name, right? You just put in the actual argument. Um, so you know all the usual sort of types are there. I'll skip that. Um, so Objective C compatibility and interop. Um, so it uses the same runtime environment. Uh, it still supports C and C++ uh, in the same app, but you can't call C and C++ app unless it's changed in the same app from Swift, like you can with Objective C. You kind of have to go through a bridge or just have it as self-contained code. Um, it can allow for some dynamic features and runtime manipulation when you've got that interop, which is most applications these days still. Um, other Swift features, barely scratch the surface. Unicode, so that's like valid Swift. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. So reverse engineering Swift applications. So there are some challenges in reversing Swift applications. It's less dynamic than Objective-C and less flexible. So it can make it harder to get some of the information that you get out of um, like the Objective-C, like the class dump and stuff like that. Um, it's less of an issue uh, when, when you've got a mixed uh, application and 
but you know it's still still harder. It's limited tooling. Um, most of the tooling isn't being updated for Swift, um, and we'll yeah we'll go into that in more detail. Um, so you know as we went through right the, mo the most common easiest way to retrieve class data from Objective C binary is class dump utility. It's one of the first things you do. You've seen how useful it is. Uh, this, is what, this is what happens when we run class dump Z up the top and, just, and the regular class dump utility on our pure Swift app. You get nothing back, right? It doesn't work, right? Sad face. So what's next? So class dump Z and class dump don't work with Swift binaries. Now what? Let's start diving into the binary. So what happens if we dump the symbol table? Well, we get some interesting information. Um, that looks kind of interesting. Kind of looks like some class information there. Um, so what happens if we look at something that we already know is in the app, like the app delegate? Um, you can't see that because this projector is not great, um, but it's coming back with a bunch of symbols. And a lot of this stuff in the middle there uh, is some of those, you know, remember I was mentioning those boilerplate methods, right? Um, a lot of those are there. So like, this looks promising, right? Um, but it's, it's really like a far cry from the output of class dump, and it's kind of hard to make out. Um, so, but the reason for that is Swift stores metadata, but a function in its symbols, uh, and in the process it mangles the name. Um, so this is a rough sort of translation of one of them, right? This is, this is a, a class and a function that's in the app. So the underscore underscore T denotes the Swift function. Then you've got the module name prefixed by the length. You've got the class name also prefixed by the length, class method. Uh, the C, sorry, denotes class method. Then you've got the function name prefixed by the length. Then you've got the return type, which is the SB, which is returning a Boolean. And like the Y and the F and the Z are things like str string protocols and stuff. I don't know why that's on there um, for this particular function, but it is, like whatever. Um, that link down there has a, a really detailed explanation on the Sw open source sort of Swift uh, GitHub page around you know, what all these things represent. Um, you can do that if you, you know, don't want to go drinking or something instead. Um, so Apple includes a utility called Swift Mangle that you can use to demangle the names. Um, that's just showing like that, that same mangled symbol, um, but with just some of the different options. So the, by default, it spits the mangled symbol back out at you, and then the other one is a demangled um, sort of version of that. And then it goes, you know, you can simplify it or you can make it more complex and, and get more information. So with that, um, you can basically, you know, create some kind of equivalent um, sort of class dump, which is what I've done, right? Um, so it's like a simple little script um, to dump classes and function signatures from a Swift binary. I put it together last night. I didn't really sleep. I'll put it up eventually when I fix it all up um, on labs.astronaut.io. Um, it's pretty hacky, but it does the job. Um, eventually, we're getting around, I'll get around to adding some more features and stuff like that. Um, but I'm in Vegas. So I'm going to be partying, so it'll be next week sometime, right? Um, so here's what it does. And you're not going to be able to see that. But basically, I'm just calling it and pa um, passing it the binary. And then it comes up. You can see here, you got the classes down the side, and then the associated functions on those classes. So you know, there's the app delegate, the view controller, and this jailbreak manager, right? And then you can see the function signatures, um, which show, um, you know, uh, the, the function name, um, the return type, any parameters. Um, the, what, why the exported parameter names became useful is the exported parameter names will actually um, show up in here, but if there's no exported parameter names, it won't. Um, so you kind of have to guess what those arguments are. Usually it's not too bad in, in iOS apps because of that design pattern that I sort of mentioned, that naming convention, where it kind of calls out what the, uh, what the sort of first parameter is, um, so you can kind of get a feel for it. Other options, um, you can use Frida or tools that are based on Frida to get some of the way there. It's not all the way, at least with my limited knowledge of Frida, but it's also a useful option, which I'll demonstrate now. And basically, this is just using the, the Frida CLI tool. Um, so I'm just uh, injecting into the, the process of this Swift app. Um, then I'm using some of the inbuilt functions, right? So this is just objc.classes, and you can see it's coming up there, um, or you can't see. That's just Got Swift demo dot you know jailbreak manager um, and you know it's basically showing all the classes right. Um, you the syntax if you're interested it's kind of different to what you'd use for Objective C classes. Um, 
if you want to reference that specifically, um, you have to basically do obj, uh, objc.classes, then put it in square brackets um, with the module name and the, the function. Um, one of the things that do doesn't work with Frida, which I was demonstrating here, is you can't get the, the methods of that class um, using the standard way that you get methods. Um, you can get inherited methods, um, but not like the, the, the methods that are implemented in that class. Um, so, so things like the jailbreak check method that's in that class are not showing up in that list. Um, so one of the things you can do, um, and you know, I'm thinking about maybe doing that, is you can use the module, um, the module class and the enumerate uh, symbols um, function, uh, and basically get a list of symbols, and you can kind of do what we're doing before with demangling the symbol name. So you could build in that demangling logic um, and you know have that in. So basically, all this is doing is getting uh, all the symbols for that module. Cool. So I'll skip that. Uh, other options, you can use a disassembler. There's a link to um, some stuff that you know some plugins that automatically disassemble it. Disassemble it. Function hooking. Let's like smash through this because I've got a few minutes. It's still possible. Um, it's much easier with Swift, mix Swift and Objective-C binaries. You can still write tweaks with mobile substrate. Um, this is a super simple class. And basically, what we're going to do is we just want to change that variable, right? Um, it's got variable, an, an int, and it's got the initializer, which sets that, right? So you can hook the getter method, and that works, right? So, so the getter method, and you're, you're changing it to return 10. Um, you can hook the setter method, and it kind of works. So you can hook the setter to, to set it to 10. Um, but certain functions in Swift are inlined, and the class constructor is one of them, so the initializer. Um, so, and it's, that's what's setting the instance variable in this case. So the set is only called again by the top level code. So if you call from there, it works. So that's why I say it kind of works. And then changing the instance variable directly, um, it works, but it's probably not a good idea because you can mess up how the app functions. The end. I did it. Cool. I don't know if I have time for questions. There's some. Do I have time? Yeah, uh, okay. There's one down in the front here. I was just wondering, um, for iOS, I have done some work in, on the Android side, but I haven't really looked into iOS. But I was just wondering if you see much of obfuscation in like uh, method names or function names or not in iOS. Not like you do commonly in Android. No, it's it's definitely not common. I have seen it after we've done pen tests where they're like. You know, we've we've exploited some functions, and then they just change it to like <laughs> random strings. But it's like the same function. Right. Um, but no, it's, it's definitely nowhere near as common as it is on Android. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. It's another question now. Okay. Hey, uh, great talk. Thanks, um, I just wanted to ask you, what's your approach when um, when trying to search dynamically uh, for uh, keys or uh, passwords or all these choice yeah. information that you can get dynamically? So it's it's not interesting. It's literally I'll go through the class dump and I will literally just you know grep search whatever it is and like look for interesting stuff, right? Um, and then sort of just scroll around from there. So look for interesting classes. Look for you know I'll search like pin, password, key, whatever, and just go through the whole thing. Um, so nothing nothing crazy, nothing super sophisticated. Yeah. Rest of the questions, please go outside and one more round of applause for Michael. Thank you. Thank you.